Thanks, Francesco. Thanks, everybody, and good morning. Uh, this is actually, I seem to be coming in uh, the San Francisco conferences uh, every second year, and it's also the second time I'm giving a keynote. Um, it was uh, something like uh, six years ago where I gave a talk about cool tools for um, uh, airline development. Uh, who was uh, in that talk or has seen it on video? Something like 10, 15 people. Um, and uh, this time I actually wanted to talk about testing tools that my group has uh, uh, produced uh, during the last uh, few years. But uh, we have actually many, so I had to choose only two of them. And given that I'm starting a bit late, I hope I'll be able to actually um, uh, cover at least one and a half of them. Um, but uh, the reason why I chose these tools is that we have had some uh, recent uh, developments in these tools that you might not be aware of. Um, and also, uh, these developments have been actually uh, motivated by applications we first uh, run on them. Uh, so the applications were actually a bit strange because they were not a typical uh, let's test an airline program type of applications. You will see in, in, the, in, the, in the talk. At this point, actually, I want to thank uh, my PhD student, Andreas Löscher, who has done quite a lot of work in the first tool that I will present. And also Stavros Aronis, uh, who recently graduated and uh, left me as a PhD student and went and joined uh, uh, Erlang Solutions. I guess uh, good things happen after you leave my group. Uh, and also Scott uh, Fritschi, who is uh, sitting there. Thank you, Scott, for the collaboration. Uh, and I hope I'll have enough time to present it uh, properly. But I want to start uh, properly. Uh, by starting intro, uh, by uh, saying some of the things we have been doing in the proper tool. Who has not heard of proper? Very good, actually, that there are about uh, 30, 40 people that have not talked of, uh, heard of proper because I actually will do a, uh, the 10 minute tutorial for, for uh, actually novices on proper. But you can see where to get uh, more information about it. Actually, the, the site has a lot of uh, information about proper. And uh, as uh, uh, I guess one of the nice things that can happen from uh, Flattery uh, is that there is a proper testing site by yours truly, uh, Fred Herbert. Uh, who actually uh, is very, very nice. So I very much recommend looking at that side, too. Uh, remember to buy me a beer afterwards. So, um, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But uh, let's see what proper is. Uh, so it's a property-based testing tool. It's inspired by QuickCheck. Um, it's an open source uh, uh, QuickCheck-like uh, uh, testing tool. And it has support for the stuff that you would expect from a, a quick check-like testing tool. Like, for example, uh, support for writing properties and test case generators using a big language with uh, macros and uh, functions that you can use. Uh, of course, I will not have time to uh, review them all. It also has support for stateful uh, testing uh, with uh, state machines and finite state machines. And you can find out tutorials about that in uh, uh, actually both the proper site and uh, in uh, uh, other places like proper testing. Uh, but it also has two other things that are not very well known. Um, one of them is actually it's fully integrated with the language of types and specs that uh, exists in Erlang. This is not a, a coincidence, given that I have had uh, a, a serious input, if not a whole design on the language of uh, types and specs uh, that Erlang has. And actually, generators sometimes come for free. You just write the types, 
and you get generators for free. We're going to see an example of that today. But it also has a very, very powerful extension that I will present for the first time in, in this audience called targeted property-based testing. And we're going to see what targeted property-based testing is. So let's see how, how it goes. So let's say that we want to write a program that does sorting. Okay, so everybody knows quick sort. So perhaps one way of writing sort uh, in Erlang is the following. Uh, sorting an empty list gives you back the empty list. And sorting a list that is non-empty, uh, let's take the first element and call it pivot. Um, and let's sort all the elements that are less than uh, the pivot. That will give us a sorted list of all the elements less than. Uh, then let's put pivot, and then let's sort all the elements that are greater than um, uh, pivot. OK? So we can write this uh, uh, function. Seems uh, straightforward. It fits in one line in an editor. It fits in two lines in this, uh, sorry, uh, it fits in, uh, yes, two lines in an editor. It fits in three lines in this uh, slide, in four lines in this slide. And let's test this. And actually, you can test this on the shell. And you can see that actually, for some cases, it works. So this is unit testing. Uh, and everybody is very familiar with unit testing, I hope, uh, in this audience. And you can take these unit tests and use eUnit or uh, some other framework like that and put them in a file and don't have to type them all the time. This is not what property-based testing is, though. We haven't done any property-based testing. To do property-based testing, we have to write properties. So what is a good property that we want from a sorting function? Well, that's here is one. We can say that we want our uh, output to be ordered. That's one property that we would like from a sorting function. So how do we write the property ordered? Using the, the language of proper, we can write that for all um, else, where else are lists, say, of integers, we want the result of sort to be ordered. OK? And we have to write, uh, so this is a generator that will generate random inputs. Uh, and we have to write the ordered predicate uh, or function is a relatively simple one. The, the empty list is ordered. The list with one element is ordered. And if you have more than one element, uh, compare the first two of them. They have to be, uh, the first has to be less or equal to the second. Uh, and also the remaining elements from the second onwards have to be ordered. OK, so that's one property. Uh, and we can include uh, the proper HRL file that gives us access to this for all macro and also allows us uh, to use lists and integers as uh, proper generators. And now we can test this. So we can fire up our um, uh, shell. We can compile the file. And then we can say proper quick check the demo program, the property ordered. And that, by default, will generate 100 random lists of integers and will uh, run this uh, uh, property. And the property actually passes 100 tests. So now we know that at least our function is doing, it satisfies this property for some confidence of 100 tests. If we want more tests, we can say, OK, run 4,711 uh, 4, tests. And that will spit 4,711 dots on your screen. And since the property is actually holding this uh, for the function, it will actually pass. OK? But uh, what have we done so far? We haven't really tested our our function. We have just tested a property. So let's write another property here. So what's another property we would like from a sorting function? Here is one. We um, want that if we give it a list of some length, then we get back the list of the same length. OK? So we can write very easily, again, using the language of proper. Uh, that uh, now 
if you take a random list and you take its length, that has to be the same as the length of the sorted list. And we can compile again the file. And now the property will actually fail. So after 14 tests, proper has uh, generated the list uh, 1, 3, minus 3, 10, and minus 3 in this run of uh, uh, the time I, I ran this. And uh, it has, this is a counterexample, and goes and shrinks this counterexample. It shrinks it a number of times and gives you back a minimum, um, for some definition of minimum, uh, uh, element for which the property does not hold. And actually, you can, uh, if you are not satisfied with this, you can run it again. And you will see that actually it will fail with a different, most likely, uh, input, which again, it shrinks down and it brings it to some uh, smaller list here with smaller elements. Uh, and why is that? Because actually we have forgotten to handle all the elements that are equal to the pivot. So I guess what we have learned so far, those of you that haven't heard of property-based testing before, is that actually you can uh, get some confidence about uh, the properties that your programs have in a very simple way. OK, so many of you actually might have heard this thing before. So let's now go to the stuff that you might not have heard. So Proper has uh, an integration with, the, simple, uh, with the, the, the language of types and specs that Erlang has. So let's say I want to define, just because I can, uh, a new type called BF for binary or fruit. and. Um, the, bi the BF type is either binary or uh, three of my favorite fruits, apple, uh, banana, and orange. And now we can take this type without doing anything else and say to proper, now use this thing as a generator. And what the proper will do is will automatically create now a generator, all the machinery that a generator needs to test now this property. And we can test this property again. And since we haven't changed the program, the property still fails. But now we get lists of binaries and fruits. And not only we get lists of binaries and fruits, but we get an automatic shrinker for binaries and fruits, which Proper has created for us. And shrinks it down to two bananas. OK? OK, you might say that this is uh, quite simple. Uh, you would not have to write too much in a, in a quick check like uh, tool to write this generator by hand. But you would have to write quite a lot to get an automatic generator in this case, where we are actually having a recursive data type, which is also polymorphic on its element. And now we can test again trees of binaries and lists of trees of binaries and fruits. And that will automatically uh, generate trees uh, of uh, uh, binaries and fruits and will automatically generate a shrinker for a recursive polymorphic data type. And if you think that this is just made up stuff, I will do a demo. I have the program here. So it generates random trees and shrinks them down. OK? So you can believe me that at least this thing works. 
So one of the things that we have been using property-based testing for is actually testing of sensor networks, property-based testing of sensor networks for all things. Of course, you can you know, use uh, proper uh, to test your Erlang programs. Uh, and uh, for those, if there is somebody who is interested in making uh, a port for Elixir, then of course we can test also Elixir programs. Uh, but that's uh, in some sense is a bit, uh, you know, the thing you would expect from proper. You wouldn't have expected to test actually sensor network programs written in C and actually for low level C. So what we've been using uh, the tool is actually for uh, some application which is not really what you would expect. So um, one of the things that you need to do when you try to test sensor networks is to be able to generate sensor networks. So what are sensor networks really? At the level of testing uh, them here, they are just a random distribution of some nodes. In this case, actually, we use UD, uh, UDB server and client nodes. And client no uh, nodes periodically send messages to uh, server code. So, and we try to test some properties of protocols that are used in sensor network. So, for example, uh, there is a protocol called XMAC. So is there um, any network for which uh, the duty cycle, i.e. The, the percentage of time that the radio is on, is greater than some percentage? So, uh, and of course, other properties of sensor networks, not only that. So how do you test that sort of thing? Well, you need to write a generator for generating graphs, because at the, at the end of the day, the sensor networks are nothing but a graph. Okay, so you have nodes, which are the, the sensor network nodes, and you have edges, which are the links between uh, these uh, nodes. So here is how you would write, uh, using the language of proper, a generator for graphs. Notice that it's not so easy to actually have just a type declaration for graphs. You could do that, but actually you wouldn't get uh, very far with that. So here is a, what a graph of n nodes looks like. Well, generate a sequence, um, a list uh, be between the, uh, all the numbers, between all the integers between 1 and n. And then uh, take a list of these, let's call them vertices. Take a list of the edges of these vertices. Uh, and the graph is nothing but a set of vertices and a set of edges. And the edges are pairs of vertices. The one-off is a built-in improper that gives you one, a, a random element of the list that you give it. Take uh, a pair of these things and make sure that actually they are not uh, the same and order them also so that uh, you have them in some canonical representation. And the use sort here removes the duplicates. So it doesn't take too much, actually, uh, effort to write a generator for random graphs using the language of proper. Now, what we want to do, for example, here is to test energy uh, properties of sensor networks. So if you think about it, the energy properties of sensor networks are actually related to how many hops you would have in the network, i.e. to what's the biggest distance from one node to another node. So we can generate random sensor networks like that. And then we need to think a bit. So let's say we have a random network like that. And let's say that we have one node that we call the sink. So obviously, the, the energy consumption will be um, related in some sense to how big a distance, what's the maximum distance from the sink. So if you want to see if your network, uh, sensor networks consumes too much energy, you need to generate a graph with, a, with a, the, the maximum distance to the sink is, is maximized in some sense. So let's say that we want to test, is there a network of n nodes where the maximum distance to the sink is greater than n over half? What do you think? 
Is there such a graph? Yes, there is one. Okay, everybody agrees? Anybody who thinks that there is no such graph? Okay, so I think everybody agrees with that. So let's test it with proper. So we can write now a property like that, the max distance. And we say that for all the graphs, the graph is the generator of within nodes that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, take the distance to the sink in this graph. Let's call this, this, this function knows what the sink is, let's say. Take the maximum of them. Is there, um, is the distance um, uh, always less than uh, n over 2? Okay? So if it's always less than 1 over 2, the property holds. Otherwise, the property is falsified, so we have found a counterexample. And here is the problem now. If we try to test this for, say, 100 tests, it will pass. For 1,000 tests, it will pass. For 10,000 tests, it will again pass. For a million tests, I've not tried it, but it will most likely pass again. So how come proper cannot actually come up with such a graph? It's too random. And what happens is that actually if you have a bunch of nodes and you take a random number of edges between them, chances are this that you will find some, you, these edges that you have will actually make the paths from, the, the maximum path from one node to another node smaller and smaller and smaller. So random generation is hopeless in this particular case. So what can you do about it really? Of course you can always write a more involved custom generator. You can say, okay, I know how to generate graphs with maximum distance. I will just create a lot, big, big chains. But that's cheating. That's really cheating because now you are writing a generator where you have actually found out yourself how, how to falsify the property. Why you write the property in the first place? I mean, really. Second, you have to write a custom generator for each, prop, for each and every property that you have in your system. You don't want to do that. So another idea that we have is, can we have an automatic way to guide the input generation? So how can we do that? Well, we can impose a search strategy on it like hill climbing or simulated annealing for those that have heard what this is. And actually this is what we do. And also introduce a feedback loop in the testing process that finds out, for example, how far we are from falsifying the property. And this is what targeted property-based testing does, which is very, very, very powerful technique. So it combines search strategy techniques with property-based testing. So rather than having a totally random generation, we are having a generation that is guided by a search strategy. And people have worked out various clever search strategies throughout the years. Simulated annealing is one of them, and it's actually very powerful. So, it automatically guides the input generation towards inputs with high probability of failing. Now, to do that, we cannot do that for any domain. We have to be able to actually um, characterize our property in terms of a utility value, in terms of what we want to, to achieve, really. So these utility values capture how close the input came in falsifying a property. And this is what you would have to write now. And you can see actually that is not particularly different than what you would write before. 
you still have your generator, your graph n. You still have the property. But rather than writing just for all, you're going to use a special for all that knows about simulated annealing. And there are other for alls for other strategies. But the simulated annealing is actually the best, the best one here. And you will have this generator under the targeted framework which will actually take the generator and will not make it random anymore, but will introduce a feedback loop. And you have to specify what your goal is. Here, what we want to do is we want to maximize the D. Or minimize something else. So it, it gives you um, functions that are like that, uh, macros that are like that. And now this thing specifies a utility value. And now the property for, for a graph of 42 ed, uh, nodes fails consistently after just a few thousand tests where it wasn't failing after hundreds of thousands of tests with quick check or with random uh, property-based testing. So this is the idea of target. It's a very, very powerful framework. Notice that it has to do quite a lot of work under the hood. And we actually have two technical papers in top testing conferences on this. The latest one, uh, the first one required the user to actually write all the infrastructure for uh, search strategy. But we have found a way to actually take it take a generator and generate all the uh, infrastructure that simulated annealing needs automatically. So notice that now the, the tool under the hood has to find a neighboring graph from the graph that it has previously generated. There is a lot of stuff that's happening under the hood. It's not magic, it's technology. <laughs> so we have used this thing in various applications, actually. One of them is this one, the XMAC protocol that I told you. Uh, the testing actually is very slow here because we are using actually an actual simulator for networks. So we have to set up a network, communicate with the simulator, uh, put, uh, run the program in C, uh, do stuff. Uh, you know, simulated the network for a while. So uh, this is comparing random property-based testing with targeted property-based testing the, in uh, running these things a number of times. So you need about 1,200 tests to uh, falsify the property. Uh, and uh, this takes about eight hours to find a, a counter example to the property of MaxMac. While with targeted property-based testing, it takes only 200 tests on average. And uh, the mean time to failure is two hours. Notice that it's not just six times less because targeted property-based testing needs to do more work under the hood. So the average time per test is almost double. The we have also used this sort of thing for testing security proper, uh, properties of uh, virtual machines, of hardware machines. Uh, this is work that it wasn't ours, actually. We uh, saw it uh, at uh, a paper first by an, in an ICFP conference and then in the Journal of Functional Programming. And we are generating a definition of a virtual machine, of an abstract machine. And then we want to find out uh, whether uh, there are non-interferences uh, or not in this virtual machine. So this is the numbers that uh, one gets by random property-based testing. We generate random programs and try to actually see um, whether we get any program that violates the security property of these machines. 
or we can uh, generate the programs uh, incrementally by a technique called by execution that the authors of that uh, work have described. And you can see that with random property-based testing, the by execution uh, uh, strategy is much better than just the naive random-based one. These are times uh, to find the counterexample. And this one just times out. It, it takes forever to, to find whenever there are some bugs in the, uh, some bug injections in the definitions of these instructions. So targeted property-based testing does exactly the same. We have a random list generator, but it's, uh, uh, feed that, feed, there is a feedback loop with a simulator annealing. And we also have a by execution. And you can see here, with targeted property-based testing, how low these numbers become. You have to compare this guy with this and uh, this guy with this. And this is done automatically. OK? Um, so the authors for uh, doing this by execution thing, they have to write a custom generator to do this by execution. Uh, targeted property-based testing, just one line of code, just to change, to say what to minimize or to maximize. OK, so that's the first type of tool, the first tool I want to uh, uh, review. Let's uh, look at the second one, which is one of my favorites. It's called Conqueror. Conqueror. And stands for concurrency error. So what Conqueror is doing, um, who has heard of Conqueror, by the way? Some people, good. Um, so it's a stateless model checker, also known as systematic concurrency test testing tool. So what is stateless model checking? Is a technique to detect concurrency errors quite fast or verify their absence. So it's a verifier now. It's not just a testing tool. By exploring all the possible ways that concurrent execution can influence the program's outcome. And it's fully automatic. It has very low memory requirements. It's not just like the, like the model checking tools that uh, run out of uh, space, run out of memory. And it's, but the catch is that it's applicable only to programs with finite executions, i.e. your unit tests, because typically you write unit tests that terminate. Sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, actually, when concurrent execution comes into play, the sometimes is true, because there might be some interleaving for which your unit test doesn't terminate, or goes in a deadlock or something. So how does uh, stateless model checking work? Uh, let's say that we have one, only one scheduler. It's boring, but let's say that we have only one scheduler. We run an arbitrary execution of the program. And then backtrack to a point where some other thread would have, would have been chosen to run. And we systematically do that sort of thing with another execution, and another execution, and another execution, and another execution. OK? And we repeat that until all choices have been explored. Or hell has uh, frozen, uh, one of the two. Whichever happens first. So uh, let's see it on an example, and I will not show Erlang here because it's easier to show it on, a, on a, an example with uh, 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 writes and reads, actually just writes in this example. Let's say that we have two shared variables, x and y, and two threads that, add, that uh, assign to these variables. We want to explore all the ways that this program can run, and we also want to check that the program doesn't crash. Now, it's very difficult to crash this program because it doesn't do anything interesting. So typically, you have to supply some correctness property. And let's say that our correctness property for this program 
is an assertion that says, at the end of the program, I want my x and y variables to be the same. To have the same value, not to be the, to, not to be the same. To have the same value. OK, so how can we do that? We start by, say, executing. We start by 0, 0 initially. And start by executing, let's say, the green thread, we go to 1, 0. Then another green thread, we go to 1, 1. And then we don't have many choices anymore. We have to execute the red thread. And at the end of this um, uh, trace, uh, the correctness property holds. So we haven't found the violation. We have to continue. So how can we continue? We have to do something different than before. So let's say we start at this point with the red thread rather than taking two steps of the green thread. So we swap these things, and now we execute this. And again, we end up uh, with 2, 2 at the end. So again, our property holds. And um, then we do something else. So we pick to run two, ste two steps of the red thread here. So now we reach a state where our property is violated. And we have found a bug in our program, One, something that violates our, our correctness criterion. OK? So the thing to take out of this is that um, it uh, systematically explores all the interleavings and uh, tells you quite nicely and quite fast when a property is violated. However, if you have a property, oops, uh, this looks a bit weird, but if you have a property that actually holds um, for all executions, then you have to explore the whole space. There is no other thing to do, right? You have to actually try everything. Now, this everything can be quite a lot. OK? So this is what Conqueror does. It explores uh, traces systematically and explores I, all the possible behaviors of the program, which we have annotated with some assertions or with some correctness criteria, and either detects concurrency errors or verifies their absence. When it detects a kind of error, you tell, it tells you exactly what the execution of all the threads has, to, how, it has how the interleaving has to happen so that you get a violation. Now, you might say, come on, this is totally hopeless. It will not actually work because, you know, literally you explore all the traces, there are really too many in any, in any reasonable program. Now, of course, that's where the technology in Conqueror is, uh, comes to play. And actually, we explore traces that should be different than each other. For some definition of different, that's quite technical. But you can think about it, actually. Let's say that you have uh, n threads that do this thing. Now, to explore all the interleavings here, you need n factorial ways of uh, exploring stuff, which obviously doesn't scale. But if you think about it, actually, to cover all the behaviors of this program, you only need to, to test one trace. So we already have an example where we have um, exponential reduction, actually factorial reduction. And that's what partial order reduction does. And Conqueror actually uses one of the, probably the most advanced dynamic partial order reduction algorithm out there. Uh, it uh, monitors the conflicts that exist between the events and only explores additional interleavings as needed and completely avoids exploring any equivalent interleavings. Now, this is dynamic. It happens at runtime. And it's actually optimal. It's guaranteed to explore only one interleaving per equivalence class. So in this case here of uh, the six different ways of running this program, Conqueror 
or DPOR, actually, optimal DPOR, will explore only four of them. Because these are the four different, um, different results you can have in the program. Now, how it's done, it's very technical. I will not explain it. You don't care, actually. So now, on top of that, you can put a bound. You can say that um, I will, I'm only interested in bounded model checking, in uh, checking what happens when um, some bounding criterion uh, holds. Like, for example, how many times I'm allowed to preempt my threads or uh, do context process switching in airline. So this, of course, doesn't tell you anything about whether your program is correct always, but it's actually very effective for testing. Because you can find bugs quite easily. So let's say that we have a preemption bound of zero, meaning that we don't allow threads to be ever preempted by other ones. Then in this case, we only need to explore the two of these six traces those where the two green ones go first and then the two red ones or the where the cases where the two red ones go first and then the two green ones if we have a preemption bound of one we are allowing one but not two preemptions so you don't explore here these two traces and you can set the preemption that you like when you use the tool. Now, all that were actually used to, to <coughs> test and verify um, chain repair algorithms for um, variants of um, uh, chain replication algorithm. So chain replication is a variant of master-slave replication. is in the context of replicated data stores. Uh, where you have a chain order, a strict chain order. So you have a number of replicas here, and you issue write requests and read requests. So the writes go and follow the chain. And uh, the last one in the chain is the one that notifies that actually the write has been propagated to all the replicas. And the read operations uh, can, for example, be serviced by the last uh, brick in the chain. Because it's known that now this chain, this brick will have the latest value. So you can do sequential reads uh, at the tail. You can do linearizable reads everywhere or dirty reads in the head or the middle. Now, the problem actually that we were trying to, s that some engineers at VMware were trying to solve is to do chain repair. What happens if, a, if a, one of these uh, things actually uh, crashes in the middle of execution? How do you bring the, cha the, the chain back? Let's say that this one crashes. So one offline, naive offline method is we stop all the surviving servers in the chain, we copy uh, the history in a new repairing node, and then we attach, attach this one in the, in the tail of the chain, and we continue execution. Okay, and there are better methods than that, but this one works, and you can prove that this is actually correct. Now, this was done in the context of uh, a replicated data store called CorfuDB, or Corfu these days which is like chain replication, but somehow different. So the responsibility here is moved to the client uh, for, for replication. Uh, it implements right one semantics. Uh, it's an immutable data store. Uh, and uh, identifies its chain configuration with an epoch number. And uh, let's skip the details here. So engineers at VMware, what they were doing, they were trying to um, investigate methods for chain repair in Corfu. And quite uh, the first one they investigate is let's add to the tail. But by just thinking on the blackboard, they saw that actually this doesn't work. 
So then they wrote uh, a model in Conqueror of the protocol, and actually Conqueror found the bug that it doesn't work. So then the second method is let's add it to the head. But at least uh, uh, I think that what they, they thought that actually this might work. Is it true, Scott, or, or it seemed obvious once upon a time. It seemed obvious once upon a time until it didn't. <laughs> and Scott posted this, this tweet. I was all ready to have a celebratory new algorithm works tweet. Then the DPOR model execution with Conqueror found an invalid cage, case. Ouch. So it turns out that actually you can module, you can model uh, Corfu in Erlang. You don't need that many things. You need quite a lot, some processes. You need one or two processes that become the servers. Um, and uh, you try to add one more server to the chain. That's another process. And concurrently, two clients try to write two different values to the same key so that you have some variation of the, of the keys and the values that you store there. Uh, so that's another four processes. While a third client tries to read the key twice to see if it actually gets the same value. So that's another process there. So you can model this with uh, processes in Erlang. And uh, you can uh, add some more processes because you need log servers and stuff like that. And now you can actually try to have some correctness properties. So one correctness property you would want is immutability, that once a value has been written in a key, no other value can be written for it. And linearizability, if a read sees a value in a key, then some subsequent reads have to see uh, for that key, have to see the same value. So then they investigated three pair methods, uh, adding to the tail of the chain, adding to the head, and adding in the middle. And Conqueror found in very few seconds, actually, less than a minute in all the time, that the two first methods don't work when you use bounded exploration, when you use bounding, preemption bounding. While the third one, it explored all the bounded traces up to that bound and didn't find any bug. But of course, we have no idea whether this actually works because it's just a bounded exploration. It doesn't uh, explore the whole search space. So if you do unbounded exploration, things become interesting. It takes actually 42 days. I'm not making this up. It's actually 42 days. We, ra we actually uh, run it afterwards uh, to uh, finish the exploration. And actually, it doesn't find any bug. Now, we went ahead and did some changes due to the things that we saw here and made Conqueror even more effective. I will skip the details of the changes, but I will give you the gist of it, and then I will stop here because I think I'm running a bit out of time. So Conqueror verifies now the third method in 48 hours after exploring a bit less than 4 million traces. But now it, we have a guarantee that this algorithm is correct. And method one, actually, uh, we find without, without bounding uh, the, the bug in just 19 seconds, where without bounding, it needed about 144 hours before we did the changes to Conqueror to find this. And I will stop here and take questions.
It's um, not very well documented. It's available. Uh, we have not documented it in the manual. Uh, we will do that. We have just written tutorials about it. So you can see a tutorial of, on using this. Yes. Uh, you have to, you have, yes, it does work. You have to compile with debug info so that uh, the information stays there in the Vim file. Francesco? No, okay, so it's not absolutely problem. not. Okay. So uh, small check and lazy small check uh, does exhaustive generation. It works for only small domains, and it guarantees that actually you get to test all of them, if I understand correctly what it does. Right. Here, uh, it works for all domains, provided that you can uh, find the utility value that you want to maximize or minimize or do something with it. 